One of the hardest tasks that I've had, and it's so brilliantly simple in my mind, the most simple things are the most complex to explain. The same thing is true in ancient Greek. Many ancient Greek terms are without translation. Don't argue with me thinking that they do, because they don't have a translation. Aristos dias, nous, ananke. Wow, the list goes on and on. These are ineffable terms of hardcore, non-linear Greek metaphysics that require, literally, and I don't mean to be hyperbolic, that require like multi-dimensional comprehension of something that cannot be, you know, you can't stick your finger on it. Uh, the same thing with uh, Greek. Math is completely different than arithmos. The ancient Greeks, uh, specifically the Platonists and Neoplatonists, the hardcore uh, monistic uh, Platonists, understood that uh, arithmos was something totally different than math. Math is just bean counting. In ancient uh, Greek arithmos, one is not even a number. One is the principle, and that is how it should be. Um, this has nothing to do with numerology. I have no connection to any of that stuff at all, okay? So please, God, don't ask me, ask me questions like that. One is not a number. One is the principle. There's also, you could say chaos, but there's, there's the notion that there's a zero. No, it's, it's a placeholder. There's no such thing. Ka, ancient uh, Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, the notion of uh, emptiness or void or null, placeholder where we're talking about magnet, there's no such thing as a number zero. Zero is not a number, and one is not a number. And the only way you can understand those is not with a linear mind, but with a nonlinear mind that's able to use and employ retroductive thinking methodologies, which I'm going to eventually have to write. Nobody's written a book on retroduction before, and I will be the first person to do so. Specifically, as regards magnetism, humanity is, of course, completely brain-dead, on what magnetism is, and I've had people try to argue that with me, and if they can't even get that far, then I have nothing to say to them. It's like, listen, you can go to the largest ma uh, magnet maker website on Earth and go to their Frequently Asked Questions page, and they'll say, how does a magnet work? And they will tell you. These are the people that are making billions of dollars selling powerful magnets. We have no idea how a magnet works. It's a mystery. Even they will tell you that, which is good. It's okay not to know stuff. I have no problem with ignorance, okay? What I have a problem with is stupidity. Stupidity is where you presume to know something, you spit out a bunch of crap, and you know you shower that on stupider people than yourself, which is what academia does. Every branch of science in academia proper, which is a gigantic pool of corrupt dumbasses, has always thought that their crap didn't stink and they got it right. We got it right! And 30, 40, 50 years later, depends on what it was, you know, the guys after them, like, they have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And today is no different. most fundamental principle in the universe, and of course, science has never defined a field because a field is not particles, and they ha cannot quantify a field because here enters the word quantity, quantification i.e. quantum. Quantum is atomism, by the way. If you don't know what atomism is, then you need to slap the person that gave you a degree either in college or high school. If you don't know what atomism is, then you got a problem. But most of you don't, probably don't know what it is because you were never taught the really important stuff in school. Important stuff in school. You see, philosophy is way too connected to religion, but religion and uh, hardcore, not Western existentialist BS philosophy, but hardcore philosophy is monistic. You know, it's not Western existentialist crap like Kant and Hume and the rest of these uh, brain-dead Western dumbasses. You weren't taught how to think this stuff because it's too close to religion. But religion is just secularized metaphysics. We're going to talk about hardcore metaphysics here. You weren't taught that stuff because the implications are leaning towards religious, and that's why you were never taught really anything important in school or college. And all education has become secularized, but the really stu important stuff, the stuff that makes you learn how to think, you know, it, it's all hardcore metaphysics. This is it, specifically regarding magnetism. Humanity thinks that, A, a magnet has poles, and magnetism is uh, about attraction and repulsion, and no, that's not how a magnet works. That's not what magnetism is. A magnet doesn't have poles. Well, sure, it's got poles. If a magnet had poles, then you could subdivide a magnet. It's like, here's the North Pole, here's the South Pole. I just split it right down the middle. It's like, that shit doesn't work. 
I know most of you, uh, none of you, have ever done this before, but the field inside of any and every magnet, whether it's a sumerium cobalt, ferrite, neodymium iron boron, it's incommensurable. Now there's an important word that you're going to go look it up on dictionary.com. You're going to come back with a bullshit definition. I'm talking about the original hardcore definition of incommensurable. If you can understand something really simple, which is not that simple because I'm into hardcore optics, by the way, like a hologram, not a holographic positive like you see on your credit card, but a holographic negative, it's like you got someone's face, and it's not a, not a positive, but a negative, which most of you, almost none of you have seen a holographic a negative, like someone's face on that holographic negative. Well, if you cut out a tiny portion, like way down here, like the person's face is up here, but there's nothing down, you cut out that tiny little portion, and you project the laser through it, you'll see the entire face again. It's like, well, how the hell is that possible? It is incommensurable. It is point nonspecific. There is no divisor line between North and South Pole. So a magnet doesn't have poles at all. The only thing that actually defines a magnet is field coherency. And that field is incommensurable, which means that it does not exist in any place. It is a pressure mediation. What's a pressure mediation? It's like seeing a bathtub full of water. You pull the cork and the water is going to go down the bathtub, right? Right, that's just pressure mediation. When you have a magnet and you say, well, there's a North Pole, there's a South Pole. I've got some magnetic viewing film like that fat tattooed asshole Ken has. And I can see there's a North Pole here, there's a South It's not located there. There's nothing located there. There's not a North Pole over here. And I say, oh, sure there is. I could see it. No, that's a pressure mediation. Because if you take that magnet and you cut it, wham, you're going to end up now with a North Pole, South Pole piece and a North Pole, South there is no place where the, either the North Pole exists or the South Pole exists or the, what I call specifically, which is technical accuracy, the plane of inertia exists. That null point between the field modalities of uh, mutual repulsion, which is magnetism. By the, by the way, force in motion and magnetism are all one and the same thing. Centrifugal force divergence, force in motion, and ma magnetism is force in motion. There is nothing within that magnet that you could say, here's a North Pole, here's a South Pole, because it cannot be divided up. It cannot be found at that location. It's a predator mediation within the entire whole, or in this case, we get the ancient Greek word holos, okay, which we, it's once we thence derive the word holography, but none of you know about holography either. But to actually truly explain the ancient Platonic uh, hardcore monistic metaphysical principle of incommensurability and don't look it up on dictionary.com because there's a bullshit definition there that doesn't tell you anything. I'm talking about the original usage of the term incommensurability. It is point nonspecific pressure mediation. The only way you're going to understand what the hell magnetism is or what the hell a magnet is if you understand the principles of incommensurability, field coherency. The magnet exists before it became a magnet when it's just a, a, a stupid piece or a lump of a ferrite or a lump of samarium cobalt or a lump of uh, neodymium iron boron, which they're all ceramic composites that has no magnetism within it. You know, what defines the magnet when it was turned into a, quote, magnet? And the only thing that's uh, done is you've actually uh, initiated field coherency by uh, pulsing that uh, ceramic object to uh, have geromagnetic precession where you actually have a reciprocating precessional hyperboloid with conjugate macro field geometry of the torus and the hyperboloid. This is the conjugate nature of the universe, by the way, force and motion, inertia and acceleration. The actual geometry of force and motion, i.e. magnetism, which is one and the same thing, is the torus. You can't technically say the sphere, but we have to be very specific and talk about the torus. Now, the inverse of a torus, i.e. the donut shape, is the hyperboloid or the hourglass shape. Okay, you know what an hourglass looks like? You turn it upside down, the sand pours. That would be the hyperboloid. If you take the negative image of the hyperboloid, you end up with the torus. You take the negative image of the torus, you end up with the hyperboloid. Retroductive logic, which none of you engaged in or none of you were taught, which is like a really important teaching methodology to learn and be able to expand your mind. It's an ancient secret that's been lost to the ages that I've uh, rediscovered. There's actually two people that rediscovered it, myself and one other person, Scott Olson. He wrote an article about it, but he still doesn't really understand it. Uh, retroductive logic necessitates that the correct definition of what we call magnetism, which is a divergent force vector of null plane of inertia. 
Okay, that which we call magnetic attraction and repulsion also doesn't exist. We've already said that there's no such thing as a North Pole and a South Pole and a magnet. It is incommensurable. I mean, this is absolutely not my opinion. It is irrefutable and hardcore, irreducibly so, via the logic and the given facts before us, that we're talking about force and counter space. What the common idiot refers to magnetic repulsion when they take two like polarities, they try to push them together. We're talking about force vector magnification. We're talking about applying, uh, since we're talking about field coherency, we're actually talking about pressure. Um, we're talking about pressure amplification. That we're actually having to apply an increasing, enormous, and an insurmountable force to try to press these like polarities together. But we're talking about force and motion. We're talking about magnetism specifically. What the common idiot refers to as magnetic attraction has nothing to do with magnetism at all. It's actually a move, or technically an acceleration, towards counter space. But magnetism is only the loss of inertia. As Faraday correctly stated, magnetism is the, quote, dielectric field. To think that magnetism is one thing and dielectricity, which nulls out at the plane of inertia, are two different things, is no different than the common dumbass who thinks that water is one thing and steam is another and ice is... A, it's all the same shit, right? Water, ice, and steam, to think that magnetism is one thing and dielectricity is another is just a perceptual brain fart of the unevolved, stupid human mind, which is not trained in retroduction, is not trained in metaphysics, which is not trained into nonlinear, hardcore metaphysical thinking as, uh, you know, all that stuff that we get so awed about, like in ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, like, wow. You know, most of you would you have a brain meltdown. If you tried to read even a crappy translation of Plotinus, a crappy one, much less than read it in the ancient Greek, which is mind-bending, mind-bending reading the ancient Greek Plotinus, which is shorthand hardcore metaphysics. It's not even it's a dead language, ancient Greek, but it's also in shorthand and it's in metaphysics. It's mind-bending. If you tried to read even a crappy English translation of Plotinus, 99% of you would have a brain meltdown, like you popped acid or you got flat on your ass drunk. He's like, what the hell am I reading? This crap's too much. Ah, my brain. Anybody that reads Plotinus, too, like, go read Plotinus. I was like, tell me what you think. And they come back and they, that's all they, I can't understand this shit. <laughs> your mind is, <laughs> your mind is not even trained. It, you're, it's like you're a mole. You know those little mole rats? They got little beady eyes. They're always digging in the dirt for worms. It's like you bring them out to the sunlight. And, oh my God. <laughs> Put me back in the dirt. You're like that. And it's okay, but your mind just can't think like that. And I'm not insulting you. Everybody's guilty of that. But yeah, retroductive uh, logic necessitates what magnetism is, what polarity is. Field incommensurability, or FI, it's a hard thing to explain to people. I've used holographic analogies, but most people don't even know what a true holographic analogy is, like the incommensurability or the holism, ancient Greek word again, holos. Some things are impossible to find, it's like some words are impossible to translate, like nous. Well, Lord Logos is like, you know, you got these ancient idiots translating parts of the Bible where they use the word logos. Like, as the word. Logos doesn't mean word. Sure it does. Logos means word. Kind of like logo. No, it doesn't mean word. No. Logos doesn't mean word. It means proportion. It means a lot. of like, depending on the context of how it was used. And I'm not a relativist at all. Well, you have these conjugate fields, inertia and the loss of inertia. Inertia being the hyperboloid, being um, inertia and acceleration. So we have inertia and the loss of inertia. That loss of inertia follows an equation. That equation is tattooed right here on my wrist, by the way, my discovery. I actually found this discovery out by deciphering the secret in Plato's uh, divided line of the Republic of 509D to 511, Plato's Republic. And repeat that, 509D to 511. It follows that equation. And once we end up with phi, 1, 1, and 1 over phi, which is phi cubed, 1 over phi to the power of negative. I could talk about hours for about that. If, for example, specifically, a computer program was written to show how to uh, turn a sphere inside out, and the max throw, interestingly, a sphere and a hyperboloid, excuse me, a sphere and a torus are close enough. We can actually say that a spatial force vector, and of course space is not a thing. We're actually defining magnitude and volume. All magnitude is equal to force. All force is equal to magnetism. 
Uh, volume, magnitude, magnetism, and force, they're all one and the exact same word. They're only differentiated out by the stupid human consciousness. Force, magnetism, magnitude, volume, all of that shit's one and the same thing. The computer uh, program shows, there's many people that have actually done it with different programs that show that when you take a sphere and you turn it inside out, the max throw of the inversion of a sphere is a hyperboloid. In other words, the absolute inverse of force in motion is the hyperboloid shape. Underneath the ferrule cell, and I have hundreds of videos on the ferrule cell, damn it, hundreds, you will actually see that toroid and that hyperboloid conjugate. And you'll notice that the torus is black on the ferrule cell. There's no light there. The only place where you actually see the light in a spirograph, quote unquote, spirograph light pattern, or i.e., the hypertrochoid pattern, is the torus. Logically, it would be the case that light is being swallowed up in the uh, hyperboloid and it is being spun out to your eyeballs under the geometry of the torus. And that's exactly what you see underneath the ferrule cell in hundreds and hundreds of videos. And by the way, before I ever even discovered the ferrule cell existed by its inventor, Tim Vandarelli, I predi predicted that this must be necessitatively so under Occam's, uh, Occam's rule of uh, simplicity, actually make Occam's rule really, really simple, it's more complex than that, that the geometry of force and motion, inertia and acceleration, i.e. Uh, dielectricity and magnetism, must and can only exist under a conjugate yin and yang, I'm going to use that word, and I hate to say yin and yang, a conjugate relationship, because most people don't know what the hell conjugate means. What's conjugate? Kind of like light and illumination. They're inseparably one and the same frigging thing. The conjugate relationship between force and motion, inertia and acceleration exists only and can only exist as the expressions of the torus and the hyperboloid working as one single holos or unity. You know, holos, one, unity. Holos is really a word that should not be trained. There's like a dozen Greek words, and they're all metaphysical. Logos, holos, uh, eristos, dias, um, uh, oh my god, ananke, on and on and on and on. Should not be translated because they're untranslated. Exists as a holos of everything. Literally everything can only be expressed in that conjugate relation because everything is force and motion, inertia, and acceleration, and the extrapolation of which, which exists within every bit of electricity and uh, field pressure modality that we understand by fields, not the counting of those fields, as, uh, as capacitance, resistance, permeability, and permittivity. Now, capacitance, resistance, permeability, and permittivity are only extrapolations and finer points of saying force and motion, inertia, and acceleration, and the interplay thereof, because nothing is truly diamagnetic and nothing is truly purely magnetic, because magnetism is just the loss of inertia, and inertia is merely the inverse of that, uh, and of course it comes first. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, we could damn well say the chicken, i.e. dielectricity or inertia. Magnetism is only the loss of that inertia, i.e. quote-unquote the dielectric field, as uh, Faraday said. Amazing enough, the really old dude, before all pure electrical uh, uh, scientific discovery was expanded, you know, made the most accurate statement about what magnetism is. It's a dielectric field. But uh, I can toot my own horn and say that I'm the first person on Earth and you can't quote Tesla, and you can't quote Sch Victor Schauberger, and you cannot quote um, Walter Russell. Those three people with all these ways. Oh, Walter Russell discovered it first. Uh, Victor Schauberger discovered it first. Uh, Nick, None of those people wrote about the stuff that's in my book. And you people don't have access to my fourth edition. I mean, my third edition, which is out free on archive.org. It's a free book, by the way. I mean, 90% of the stuff that's in that book is not anything you'll find by Schauberger, Tesla, and um, Walter Russell, much less the 4th, 5th, and 6th editions. None of those people, uh, nor Eric Dollard, and I have all of Eric Dollard's work. He did help me contribute to the book and my understanding of counter space by his, you know, titanic understanding of electrical theory. But none of those people, including Dollard, those four people, you know, they're not responsible for my book. They have helped me see far, further, far, <laughs> I almost said far, have helped me see further, but I'm responsible for that discovery. Not you and not them. So that's where I'm going to toot my own horn, because it's my discovery. Yeah, the one thing I'm going to take to my grave is 
to me anyway, and it is, because what's the most fundamental principle in the universe? Well, it's magnitude and volume, which is force and motion, i.e. magnetism. It's like, well, who's the first person on planet Earth that actually figured out what the hell magnetism is? It's like, it was some fat, tattooed, bald dude. Really? Yeah, he actually figured it out first. And that, Jack, is the damn fact. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to go back to my room and continue working on my book. If you like this video, you could always drop a donation because I live cheaply. And boy, do I live cheaply. I get tired of eating cheap food, too. <laughs> I like a steak. I like a steak. <laughs> I probably shouldn't eat. You always click the link below. Tell me to jump off a cliff. Don't watch. Do watch. Subscribe. Don't subscribe. I've never told anybody to subscribe, so I take that back. Never. I don't work off popularity contest sort of crap. I am not a guy that believes in that sort of anything. Nothing true. This is my motto, by the way. Nothing true is popular, and nothing popular is true. I live by that motto. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Dos vidanya. Hasta luego. All that crap. Aloha.